Welcome to our podcast, Tis But a Scratch, Fact and Fiction About the Middle Ages. I'm your host, Professor Richard Abels, and my co-host, partner for life and inspiration for all things medieval, is my wife, Ellen. Today, we're going to talk about Vikings. Vikings in Europe of the 8th and 9th century were dedicated to a pagan god of war, Odin. Cramped by the confines of their barren icebound Northlands, they exploited their skill as shipbuilders to spread a reign of terror then unequaled in violence and brutality in all the records of history. The greatest wish of every Viking was to die sword in hand and enter Valhalla where a hero's welcome awaited them from the god Odin. Their abiding aim was to conquer England, then a series of petty kingdoms, each one the jealous rival of the next. It was no accident that the English Book of Prayer contained this sentence, Protect us, O Lord, from the wrath of the Northmen. That's the opening scene from the 1958 box office hit movie, The Vikings, based very, very loosely on the saga of Ragnar Lodbrok. I thought it would be a good intro for today's episode because it captures most of the popular stereotypes about Vikings, but also makes an important point. You didn't have to be a Scandinavian to become a Viking. Even two New York Jewish kids like Kirk Douglas, birth name Isord Danielovich, and Tony Curtis, the former Bernie Schwartz, could grow up to be Viking chieftains. Of course, it helps to be the legitimate and illegitimate sons of the fierce Viking king, Ragnar Lodbrok, or as he was known off screen, Ernest Borgnine. Oh, God. The film also starred Janet Lee as a captive Welsh princess and love interest of both male leads. Curtis won out, as was only proper given that he was then married to Lee, although according to Hollywood gossip, the marriage was in trouble. Jamie Lee Curtis, who was also born in 1958, called herself a Save the Marriage Baby. Too much information. And surprise, I haven't seen the film and don't want to. It sounds truly terrible. Actually, the movie is fun if you ignore the history. Yeah, right. It opened to good reviews and overall holds a 76 fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Most importantly, it made a ton of money and spawned both a television series, Tales of the Vikings, produced by Kirk Douglas, and several other Viking films. But you'll be happy to know that I won't be talking about any of them in this episode. Thank you. I mean, I'm not a complete media slugger. I mean, under duress, I did watch a couple of episodes of The Last Kingdom. And what did you think? It was not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. Pretty good, actually. Well, right. we'll, yeah, we'll talk about that miniseries and the novels of Bernard Cornwell, and you can read novels upon which that series is based in a later episode about King Alfred the Great. <sighs> You'll like it. I would also like to do an episode on the recent movie, The Northmen, and maybe the television series, The Vikings and the Vikings Valhalla. <sighs> okay. Is that a threat? Don't worry. I'll do that episode with someone who actually likes movies, because I'm too good a husband to force you to watch them. Though, I think you might like The Northman. Think again. (laughs) Please, you can't judge it without seeing it. The director, Robert Eggers, really made an effort to capture the tone and ethical sensibilities of the sagas, and he did with this movie... What he did with a previous movie, The Witch, which was about 17th century New England, he went to lengths to make the settings, costumes, and language of the Northmen as historically faithful as possible. Now, the -the over-the-top violence of the film, especially when its hero, Amleth, is a berserker, may be a bit much to you, or actually a lot too much for you. And the movie does get intense at times. That's why I don't like watching a lot of movies. Yeah, I know. 
So, no movies today, just history and historical speculation. Thank you. I guess we could begin with basics, like who and what the Vikings were. There is nothing more basic than Wikipedia. So let's start with its entry on Vikings. You want to do the honors? Uh, according to Wikipedia, and I quote, Viking is the modern name given to seafaring people originally from Scandinavia, paren, present-day Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, close paren, who from the 8th to the late 11th centuries raided, pirated, pirated is a verb, anyway, traded and settled throughout parts of Europe. They also voyaged as far as the Mediterranean, North Africa, Volga, Bulgaria, the Middle East, and North America. In some of the countries they raided and settled in, this period is popularly known as the Viking Age. Usually said to be between the mid-8th and the mid-11th century. As they said. Wikipedia continues, the term Viking also commonly includes the inhabitants of the Scandinavian homelands as a collective whole, end quote. I have to confess that I like Wikipedia. I like it a lot more than many of my colleagues in academia. Wait a minute, that's ambiguous. Are you saying you like it a lot more than you like many of your colleagues? <laughs> you you need to clarify that. Both. No, 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 no okay. No, okay. No, I like Wikipedia much more than many of my colleagues like Wikipedia. Okay. And I even donate money to it every year. And I approve. I found that the more obscure the topic, the more reliable the Wikipedia entry is. This is true for medieval subjects, partly because those entries were created by people interested in those subjects and then edited by experts. As you did a few years ago with the Alfred the Great entry. Yeah, and the entry was subsequently re-edited because I made the mistake of not citing my own published work. No reward for modesty, huh? Um, you could have actually said that with a little bit more sincerity. I hadn't realized that one needs to cite published sources to authenticate facts and interpretations, so some of what I wrote got tagged as original research, which is not a Wikipedia compliment. I, I, I love the characterization of Wikipedia as something that can only work in practice but never in theory, and the Wikipedia entry on Vikings is not at all bad. But I do have a problem with its characterization of Vikings as a seafaring, quote, people originally from Scandinavia, end quote, and its observation that, quote, the term Viking also commonly includes the inhabitants of the Scandinavian homelands as a collective whole, end quote. It's certainly true that it's used that way today, but that's not what it meant during the Viking Age. As used in the early and high Middle Ages, the term Viking was not a synonym for early medieval Scandinavians, although, although as the Wikipedia entry states, Vikings is often used that way today, nor did it mean a fierce warrior as movie makers, war gamers, and Minnesota football fans like to believe. And, of course, neo-Nazi white supremacists like the American religion of, quote, a satru. Yeah. As a historian what, of what used to be called Anglo-Saxon England that is now early medieval Britain, I hate that ultra-right-wing groups have appropriated so much of the terminology of my field. And they have done so without a clue about the history and meaning of these terms. Okay, so, I'll bite. What did Viking actually mean in the Viking Age? The etymology of the word Viking is obscure and is a continuing subject of academic debate. Surprise, surprise. Some writers have derived it from the Norse word for fjords. Others think that it refers to the men of the, of the Viken regions of Norway around Oslo. Another possibility is that it derives from the Old Norse verb vikja, to travel, often used for sea voyages. Whatever its etymology, what is more certain is that in both Old Norse and Old English, the term Viking referred to raiding or piracy. Old Norse had two words related to the modern word Viking. One was Viking, which meant an overseas raiding expedition. The other was Vikinga, one who goes on a raiding expedition. Now, the earliest appearance of the word is in an 8th century English biblical epic, Exodus, where weeching refers to a band of robbers. In a Latin Old English glossary, the Latin term parodici, pirates, is glossed as weeking shethen, which means basically robber band. 
Despite its ubiquity in modern history, books, movies, novels, etc., the word Viking is not commonly found in contemporary sources. The most common terms for these raiders in Frankish and English sources were Northmen and Danes. Irish sources called them foreigners, the Gaul, and Byzantine sources called them the Rus. Even in Old Norse, being a Vikinger was not a compliment. The appropriate compliment for a man who proved himself in combat was Drenga, roughly meaning a good lad. So what did Scandinavian and Anglo-Saxon mean when they called someone a Viking? An Anglo-Saxon would say that you were a pirate. A Dane, Norse, Swede, or Icelander would say, more neutrally, you were a seafaring raider. In either case, Viking was an occupation or activity, not an ethnic designation. You say that being a Viking was a profession, but I've read translations of a number of sagas where it seems to have been a seasonal activity, or maybe even a seasonal interlude for landowners and farmers. Some Viking raiders undoubtedly were men like the Orkneyinga sagas, Svein Aslifesen, who went a Viking in the Hebrides every spring after he'd overseen the sowing of his fields and every fall after the harvest. I think that this was pretty typical of Vikings in the first half of the ninth century. For these men, going a Viking was a seasonal activity. But this changed in the second half of the ninth century. The crews of those Viking fleets were filled with men who practiced piracy as a profession. By the 860s, the ambitions of the leaders of larger Viking fleets had turned to conquest, at least in Britain and Ireland, while the aspirations of their crews were no longer to return to their homeland enriched with plunder, but to settle abroad as wealthy farmers. Viking, as I said before, was not a synonym for Scandinavian. Most Scandinavian farmers never went to Viking, and many Vikings were not, in terms of genomes at least, Scandinavian. Recent scientific studies raise questions about how Scandinavian the Danish, Norse, and Swedish Viking bands actually were. Two genetic studies of skeletons from Viking Age Scandinavian burial sites, one in 2020 and the other in 2022, found a lot more genetic diversity in early medieval than mixed modern Scandinavia. Evolutionary geneticist Eska Villerslev, a professor of ecology and evolution at the University of Copenhagen and director of its Center of Excellence in Genetics, who led the 2020 Viking Genome Project, explained, quote, It's pretty clear from the genetic analysis that Vikings are not a homogenous group of people. A lot of the Vikings are mixed individuals, close quote, with ancestry from Southern Europe, Turkey, and Scandinavia. As science writer uh, Kenneth Smith put it, quote, Vikings swapped DNA pretty freely with the other people they encountered, sometimes with all parties' consent and sometimes not. The result was that Viking society was far from homogenous and surprisingly cosmopolitan, close quote. The nationality of a Viking warband was defined by its leaders, and as much as ultra-white supremacists might like to think otherwise, tribal identity in the Viking Age was cultural rather than genetic. A Danish Viking fleet meant that the captains of the ships were Danes or identified themselves as Danes. The members of a Viking boat, however, could well be ethnically heterogeneous. Medieval Irish sources, for instance, tell of Irish foreigners, natives who decided to join Viking armies, preferring the role of predator to prey. English sources tell of slaves who ran off to join Viking crews, Mostly, though, crews were drawn from the class of free men called Bondi and their tenants. Bondi? Do we get the word husband from that? And what about slaves? Ninth century Scandinavia was a slave-owning society. Did slaves serve in Viking crews? Uh, yeah, w our word husband derives from Old Norse, husbande, which means master of the house. And Viking Age Scandinavia was a slave-owning society. And a slave-selling society. Very much so. The basic social division in early medieval Scandinavia was between the free and the unfree. Norse society was hierarchical. At the top were kings and those of royal blood. Next came a hereditary aristocracy, the Jarls. The majority of the male population, as well as the crews of Viking vessels, were farmer landowners, the Bondi. Status among them was based on wealth. Iceland had no kings or Jarls, 
but the wealthiest freemen were called Gothar, chieftains, which referred to their lordship over men rather than rule over territory. Kings and nobles had warrior household retainers. Wealthy landowners had tenant farmers, and even they probably owned some slaves. Freedom meant to be almsworthy and lawworthy. That is, a free man had the right to speak at the local assembly, known as a thing. He also had the right to bear alms. The close relationship between the status of being almsworthy and lawworthy is captured in the term for local district courts in the 10th and 11th century English Dane law, Vapnatak in Old Norse, which became Wapentake in Old English, literally, weapons touching. The lives of freemen were protected by the threat of their kinsmen vengeance, that is, blood feud, and were valued according to a sliding scale of compensation, the wear guild, reflecting the status of the social man. The killing of a slave, a thrall, in contrast, was regarded as a property crime. It was not all that different, except in terms of cost, from the killing of a cow. The sign of thraldom was a slave collar and cropped hair. In Scandinavia, slaves were forbidden from bearing arms, and I haven't seen any evidence of Scandinavian slaves being recruited as Vikings. Foreign slaves were a different matter. Able-bodied male slaves sometimes ran away to join Viking bands. If a runaway slave was received into a Viking band, he not only achieved the status of a free man, but could claim the wear guilt in England of a thane. Archbishop Wolfstan II of York saw this as a perversion of the divine social order. In his famous Jeremiah against the sinfulness of the English people, the Sermon of the Wolf, he inveighed against it as one of the, quote, loathsome laws and shameful exactions common among the English people because of the wrath of God, end quote. Okay. I assume that the status of the runaway slave depended upon whether the Viking captain saw this saw the runaway as more valuable as a crew member than as a commodity. Undoubtedly, it was all about profit. Viking boats were privately owned, and their captains and owners were wealthy farmers, while the leaders of Viking fleets came from the hereditary aristocracy. What they all shared was a common purpose, to extract as much wealth as they could from their overseas ventures. What do primary sources tell us about Vikings? Historians of early medieval Europe have to deal with the scarcity of sources. This problem is especially true when it comes to Vikings. Vikings are mainly known through the writings of their victims. There are few contemporary Scandinavian written sources for Vikings, and these are either terse inscriptions on runestones or cryptic skaldic verses. And then, of course, there are the Old Norse sagas which certainly have uh, shaped the way I think about Vikings. The Old Norse sagas are wonderful reads, but they're problematic as historical sources. Most were written in the late 12th through 14th centuries by Icelandic authors such as Snorri Sturluson. Um, in other words, centuries after the end of the Viking Age and by Christians. Yeah, centuries after. And that's too often ignored by the script writers and producers of television shows and movies about Vikings. Literary scholars divide the Old Norse sagas into several genres. The Sagas of the Kings, of which Snorri's Heimskringler is the prime example, tell stories about the kings of Norway, beginning with a mythical past and continuing into the 12th century. Although the word saga means history, these king sagas are not histories, even by the standards of 12th century Anglo-Norman historians such as William of Malmesbury and Orderic Vitalis. The sagas are episodic, filled with anecdotes about the adventures of Icelanders in the courts of the kings of Norway, and focused mainly on dynastic conflicts. The sagas of the Icelanders, or as they were also known, family sagas, tell stories about the early settlement of Iceland. The plots revolve around family relations and conflicts. One theme that predominates is the conflict between the establishment of law and the persistence of traditional responses to injuries and wrongs, the blood feud. Some of these sagas follow their protagonists abroad as they take up a Viking life. They are written in a straightforward and highly realistic style that provides very similitude to the stories they relate, and they may well contain valuable information about the settlement of Iceland in Old Norse culture 
though it takes a really good historian like Professor Jesse Bayock of UCLA to distinguish between what is historically authentic and what is not. The Icelander sagas also contain an abundance of genealogical information about each character. This little-known Icelandic saga, written by an unknown hand in the late 13th century, has remained undiscovered until today. Now it comes to your screens for the first time, fresh from the leaves of Iceland's history, the terrible Njol Saga. It's not that terrible. No, I meant terribly violent. Oh, yeah. yeah. Eric Njol, son of Hrothgar, leaves his home to seek Hangnor the Elder at the house of Thorvald Hrodvizir, the son of Goodleaf, half-brother of Thorgir, the priest of the Water, who took to wife Thorin, the mother of Thorkel Braggart, the slayer of Goodman the Powerful, who knew Harold, son of Gernund, son of Eric from Gudalis, son of Arvard Bisselbeard, son of Hagen, who killed Bjortgard in Sokhnadale in Norway, over Gudreed, daughter of Thorkel Long, the son of Kettle Trout, the half-son of Harbjorn Halfjol, Godard of Ingbard the Brave, who wed Eisenbert of Gothenburg, the daughter of Hangbard the Fierce, of the... apologised for an error in the saga. Evidently, Thorgir, the priest of the Ozawater, who took to wife Thor and the mother of... I was wondering how you would get in a Monty Python reference. My bet was on Eric the Viking. That movie fits in better with an episode about Viking movies. The point about the sagas is that they are not primary sources. They're best thought of as historical novels. They are entertainments written by Christian authors about their savage pagan ancestors to provide thrills to their readers. Their protagonists are as much anti-heroes as heroes. Like the hero or anti-hero of one of my favorites, Eil Saga. Eil. Eil Saga. I know that Eil Skallagrimson is supposed to be an heroic Viking and a talented poet, but he seems to verge on being a psychopath. Verge? I think he, I think he's over the edge on that case. So is his father, Scholar Grimm. You're probably thinking about the story of how the six-year-old Eil responded to losing a ball game. So why don't you tell that story? And how his mother responded. Eil's father, Scaligrim, loved competitive games, in particular a ball game that was popular at the time. One of Scaligrim's tenants was a young man named Thord, who captained Scaligrim's ball game team. Eil was large for six and had already shown himself to be quick-tempered and headstrong, so that all of Scaligrim's men took care that their sons knew when to give in to him. One day, Scaligrim took his son to a ball game. A lot of the other players also brought their sons, so the youngsters were divided up in two teams, so they could play. Eil was matched against Grim, son of Heg of Hegstead, who was four or five years older and strong for his age. When Eil was outplayed by Grim, he lifted his bat and struck Grim. Grim then took hold of Eil and threw him to the ground and began to hit him. As Eil lay there, Grim told him that if he wouldn't behave himself, he would do him some real damage. Eil got up and left the field to the jeers of the other youngsters. When Eil told Thord what had happened, Thord gave him the axe he was carrying so he could repay Grim. They came to the field just in time to see Grimm racing with the ball to the goal, pursued by the other boys. Ale intercepted him, struck him on the head with the axe, killing him. Of course, the upshot of this was a battle among the adults in which seven men, including Grimm's father, Hegg, were killed. And we complain nowadays about, um, about parents. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyway. But when Ale's mother was told what her son had done, she said approvingly that Ale had the makings of a real Viking, and it was obvious that as soon as he was old enough, he ought to be given a longship. A few years later, Skallagrim, playing against Thord and Ale, grew so angry at being outplayed that he threw Thord to the ground so hard that he shattered all of his bones and killed him. And he would have done the same thing to his son if a slave woman hadn't intervened. He killed the slave woman instead. An angry 12-year-old Ale took vengeance by killing his father's estate manager because his, he knew that his father really liked the guy. According to the saga, Skallagrim said nothing, and that was the end of the matter, though for the rest of the winter neither father nor son spoke even one word to each other. <laughs> 
And soon after that, Ale began his career as a Viking. Under the command of another landowner who reluctantly accepted Ale into his crew, commenting that if his father couldn't control him at home, there was little chance that he could do so abroad. And he was right. Ale's career began by him earning a death sentence from King Eric Bloodaxe, who was then king of Norway before he became king of York, by killing one of Eric's men in a drunken state while at the king's court. But Ale was able to escape unharmed. Well, Ale Saga certainly provides a vivid portrait of a remarkable Viking adventurer, but how much of this is historically true? Like I said, I mean, I hope not too much. Like I said, Ale Saga should be read as a historical novel, but like all good historical novels, its setting includes real historical figures such as Eric Bloodaxe and Ale's patron in England, King Athelstead. What is authentically 10th century, however, are the verses quoted by the author. Ail was a wealthy farmer in Iceland, a Viking, a warrior retainer, and a skaldic poet. It was the last that made him famous. I have little doubt that he himself is a historical figure, but the narratives of the sagas, once again, are not primary sources, and although writers like Snorri Sturluson quoted skaldic poetry, It doesn't mean that they really understood it. I've read some of the poems in the sagas, and I don't understand them either. It isn't easy. This is the point. Skaldic poetry is not meant to be easy. It's meant to be a verbal puzzle filled with poetic metaphors, kennings, things that you had to figure out. Scandinavians of the Viking Age may be portrayed as barbarians, but they enjoyed verbal and visual riddles. They enjoyed games of strategy. And the poetry that they wrote reads like crossword puzzle clues. And sometimes even their violent actions are portrayed as being unusually clever. Yeah, cleverness, witticisms, insults are all part of this Viking culture. But somewhere beneath it, there still seems to be blood metaphors. I'm now reading a book about women in the Viking Age, and the author quotes a contemporary source where where three Valkyries are working a loom. Only the loom that they're working, the weights are actually human skulls. And instead of, of, of wool, the textile is using human entrails to make the picture. These Valkyries are not beautiful women on an opera stage. They are very dark, very bloody, very frightening. And you know something, I give credit to Robert Eggers and to the filmmakers of The Northmen for portraying Valkyries in that manner. Mm -hmm. The problem of interpreting what the Scalds really meant and what their metaphors meant is particularly interesting in the case of a ritual called the Blood Eagle. An alleged ritual. An alleged. Isn't it especially grotesque um, form of execution, or is it simply an exceptionally grotesque metaphor? Exactly. (laughs) The blood eagle has been interpreted as a method of ritual sacrifice of captured royalty to the god Odin. The victim was laid upon a table on his stomach, his ribs were separated from his spine by a sharp knife, and then his lungs were drawn out and spread over the ribs, giving the impression of an eagle's wings. Okay, and how does that relate to skaldic poetry? Professor Roberta Franks argues that the blood eagle ritual was based on a misunderstanding of complex and obscure skaldic verses meant to convey the idea of an eagle scoring the back of a man who fell in battle. The blood eagle appears only in a very few medieval sources. It's described most fully in the Orkney Inga saga, which was written around 1240. Quote, Einar made them carve an eagle on his back with a sword, and cut the ribs all from the backbone, and draw the lungs there out, and gave him to Odin for the victory he had won. Close quote. Snorri Sturluson, writing about the same time, describes Earl Einar, cutting the blood eagle on the back of his enemy, Hafton Halleck, quote, He thrust his sword into his chest by the backbone and severed all the ribs down to the loins and then pulled out the lungs, end quote. The Danish historian, Saxo Grammaticus, writing around the year 1200, claims that Ivar and Bjorn, sons of Ragnar Lothbrok, 
avenged their father by ordering Ella's, quote, back to be carved with the figure of an eagle because at his overthrow they were imprinting the cruelest of birds on their most ferocious enemy. Not content with impressing a wound upon him, they then salted his mangled flesh, end quote. Yeah, I see a problem here. I thought most historians regarded Ragnar Lothbrok as a fictional character. They do. But from what you've already said, I assume there's some skaldic verse that mentions this? Yes. The earliest possible reference is a poem by the skald Sikvat Thorthason, who died in 1045. The verse literally reads as follows. And Ella's back had had the one who dwelt, Ivar, with or by an eagle, York Cut. Now, Roberta Franks makes sense of this as the following. And Ivar, the one who dwelt at York, had Ella's back cut by an eagle. According to Franks, all that Sigvat meant was that Ivar killed Ella and left his corpse face down on the battlefield to be preyed upon by an eagle. Well, pagan Scandinavians did make animal and sometimes human sacrifices to their gods in whatever manner. Yeah, which is the point made by Alfred Smith, who argued for the authenticity of the ritual. Adam of Bremen, in his Deeds of the Bishops of the Church of Hamburg, reports that the bodies of sacrificed animals and men were hung from trees in the grove of the great pagan temple at Uppsala. And, of course, the 10th century Muslim traveler Ibn Fadlan, who wrote a detailed account of his visit to a Rus settlement on the Volga, and who seems to have spent the whole time in a, in a state of horrified but <laughs> yeah. understandable disgust, described the sacrifice of a slave girl to accompany her dead master to the afterlife. Yeah, although according to Ibn Fadlan, this particular slave girl was a willing volunteer. If the blood eagle was a real ritual, those who underwent it were not volunteers. Well, do you think it was real? I don't. I don't. But I wouldn't discount it completely out of hand. In a recent issue of Speculum, the flagship journal of the Medieval Academy of America, Professor Luke John Murphy of the University of Iceland and a team of anatomical specialists argued that the ritual was physically possible, though the full ritual would have required a great deal of strength on the part of the executioner, and the victim would have probably died very, very soon after the severing of the ribs. They also argue that it was culturally plausible, and um, one shouldn't forget that from the time of King Henry III of England, and so what we're talking about is from the 13th century, the penalty for traitors to the English crown was to be hanged, drawn, and quartered, which involved hanging the culprit until nearly dead, followed by emasculation, disembowelment, beheading, and quartering, that is, chopping the corpse into four parts. Hanging, drawing, and quartering was practiced into the late 18th century in England, wasn't abolished by Parliament until 1870. And this, of course, was probably what the founding fathers of the United States had in mind when they prohibited, quote, cruel and unusual punishments, close quote, in the Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, but to answer your question, I'm not persuaded by the article. I'm not even sure why Speculum published it. Just because the ritual was theoretically possible doesn't really add much to the question whether it was actually practiced. My problem with the Blood Eagle is that it appears in no Frankish or English or Irish or Muslim source from the Viking Age. Monks loved to portray Vikings as savage beasts, and the Blood Eagle would have fit really nicely with that, and yet no one mentions it. My sense is that Roberta Franks got it right. Uh, but I'm not surprised that the Blood Eagle made it into the sagas. Sagas were stories written by Christian authors who took delight in depicting the savagery of their pagan ancestors. And they were also entertainments. To use them as historical sources for Vikings is like using Braveheart or Kingdom of Heaven as sources for medieval history. That bad, huh? Yeah, that bad. Okay, while well, we're talking about um, historical impossibilities, where did everybody get the idea that Vikings had helmets with horns or wings on them? Are you telling me they didn't? No, okay, they didn't, really. Okay. Credit for the myth of the Viking horned helmet goes to Carl Emil Doppler, the costume designer for the first performance of Wagner's Ring of the Nibelungen cycle at Beirut in 1876. 
Doppler may have been inspired by late Bronze Age Nordic ritual helmets, such as those found at Graven's Venge, Zealand, Denmark, in 1779. Whoa, whoa, you said late Bronze Age. When was that? Uh, from about 800 to 500 BCE. Okay, so at least a few hundred years before the Vikings. A lot before Vikings. Okay. Haunt and wigged helmets were part of 19th century German nationalist myth-making. That horn helmets are bogus seems to have made it into the popular consciousness now. Finally. Finally. Horn helmets don't appear in recent movies or television shows about Vikings. Nowadays, they're pretty much restricted to the comic strip Hager the Horrible and to Halloween Viking costumes. Okay, so where do we get the modern image of Vikings in popular culture, and how close is it to what historians think about Vikings? I think the modern image owes a lot to medieval sources, but the medieval sources it owes to are 9th and 10th century English and Frankish monastic chroniclers who regarded the Vikings as these savage beasts and to the saga literature. In other words, it's fashioned from accounts of victimized churchmen and from lurid historical novels written centuries later. Exactly. Both portrayed Vikings as barbaric pagans, but arguably the Vikings as we now know them was an invention of 19th century Romantic and nationalist Scandinavian and British historians. Danish and Norwegian historians found in them a history of ancestral greatness. English historians, particularly in the Victorian period, saw them both as the other in the story of Alfred and as part of their own Germanic past. Modern media, movies, televisions, graphic novels, fantasy novels, perpetuate this conception of Vikings although without either nationalist nostalgia or Christian condemnation. So, how accurate is the modern image of Vikings as savage raiders who killed indiscriminately and lusted not only for loot, but for glory? We shouldn't discount the brutality of Vikings. But they probably did not kill as wantonly as they seem to do in movies and television. They were after movable wealth, which included able-bodied men, women, and children whom they could sell as slaves, they weren't pagan crusaders who sacked monasteries and sacrificed monks to Odin and Thor. They sacked churches because churches were filled with liturgical silver and gold. Sort of like the famous bank robber who, when he's asked why he robbed banks, replied, that's where the money is. Please. So it's not that surprising. In the local warfare among Christian Irish kings in the 8th and 9th centuries, the enemy's monasteries were often targeted. And one reason that Christian bishops promoted the Peace of God movement in the 11th century was to protect churches and clergy, which suggests there was a need to protect churches, churches and, and clergy. clergy. Vikings also weren't really warriors. They would defend their loot in battle if necessary, and they certainly admired good fighters, drangers, good lads, but they preferred to avoid general engagements if possible. There was no profit in it. The purpose of going a Viking had less to do with winning glory in a place in the great hall of Valhalla than to acquire wealth. The easiest and preferred way was to persuade a king, bishop, or magnate to purchase peace with silver. Not terribly heroic, but safe and profitable. And that is called paying the Dane Guild. But we've proved it again and again, that if once you've paid him the Dane Guild, you'll never get rid of the Dane. Thank you, Mr. Kipling. And Kipling was absolutely right. As he often was. The payment of silver to a Viking band purchased a truce, not a lasting peace. Arguably, the payment of tribute encouraged Vikings to return for more. As the word spread about the vulnerability of their wealthy neighbors to the south, the Viking fleets that raided Francia and England grew in size throughout the 9th century. Throughout the second half of the 9th century, they continued to crisscross the English Channel in search of easy game. But the vulnerability of the English kingdoms encouraged a grander ambition among the leaders of the composite force called the Great Heathen Army. Why be satisfied with taking some wealth when one could take it all? By the 860s, it seems that many men in these Viking fleets had reconciled themselves to leaving their homelands permanently and settling in England and Francia. And the activity of Vikings really wasn't all that extraordinary for the time. Raiding and slaving were normal early medieval activities for Christian as well as pagan warrior societies. 
The prosperity of Charlemagne's, Charlemagne's kingdom was based on his constant and usually successful wars, which produced enormous numbers of slaves and lots of portable booty, as well as large territorial additions to his Frankish empire. That the Vikings raided England, that the Vikings raided, needs no explanation. When and how they did, though, does. Yeah, and I agree with you entirely about the about how typical they were for the age. The when for the Viking age is it began in the mid to late eighth century. The very first reference to Vikings appears in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle entry for, under the year seven eighty seven. Quote: In the days of King Bertric of Wessex, there came for the first time three ships. And then the king's reeve at Portland rode thither, and tried to compel them to go to the royal manor, for he did not know what they were, and they killed him. These were the first ships of the Danes to come to England, end quote. This was followed in 793 by a truly traumatic event, the pillaging of the great island monastery of Lindisfarne, the holy island off the northeast coast of Britain. To quote again from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, In this year, terrible portents appeared over Northumbria and miserably frightened the inhabitants. These were exceptional flashes of lightning and fiery dragons were seen flying in the air. A great famine soon followed these signs. And a little after that, in the same year, on the 8th of June, the harrying of the heathen miserably destroyed God's church in Lindisfarne by rapine and slaughter, end quote. In the 830s, the size and frequency of Viking raids on England and France and Ireland increased. In 834, Vikings attacked Frisia, laid waste the important trading town of Dorstadt on the mouth of the Rhine, and returned for the next three years in a row to pillage this port city. From 841 to 892, West Francia was subject to wave after wave of Viking raids. Okay, we have the when, the late 8th century. Why? The beginning of the Viking Age doesn't have a single cause. What a surprise! Historians have suggested several factors. First, overpopulation in Scandinavia, and there's some archaeological evidence for new farmsteads established in sparsely populated areas of Sweden and Norway in the late 8th and 9th centuries. Well, something has to explain why anyone would have landed in Iceland and thought, hey, this would be a great place to settle, and not even, not to mention Greenland. Yeah. A second factor was the endemic warfare between the many petty kingdoms of Scandinavia in the 8th and 9th centuries, which resulted in the losers becoming exiles and adventurers. Young, landless freemen, the sons of farmers, joined them to acquire the wealth needed to pay the bride price essential for marriage. And how do we know this? From archaeology. Okay. Plunder from Viking raids has surprisingly been often found in graves of women. Really? Yeah, really. Huh. But I think the most important factor was the increase of trade in the North Sea in the late 8th and 9th century. That resulted in the creation of emporia like Dorschadat along the shores of Francia and southern England, and that in turn attracted the attention of enterprising pirates. The British historian Peter Sawyer argued that the growth of trade between Western Europe and Scandinavia was the factor most responsible for creating the Viking Age. Quote, it was the Western European demand for northern products such as amber, ivory, furs, and the parallel Scandinavian demand for Western goods that caused close contacts between the two areas and encouraged Scandinavians to search for new supplies in the far north or east of the Baltic. This trade enhanced the power of some Scandinavian rulers by increasing their wealth. Others who were less successful or even exiled could resort to piracy, first in the Baltic and later in the West, an extension that was facilitated by the adoption of the sail. This trade also tempted pirates, and the competition between traders and merchants must have speeded up the development of the remarkable sailing ships that are indeed the key to the Viking Age, end quote. Sawyer was a minimalist when it came to Vikings. He argued that chronicle reports of Viking fleets numbering several hundred ships were exaggerated, and that Viking armies rarely numbered more than a few hundred, at, or at the very, very outmost maybe 
a thousand or a couple of thousand men. He also downplayed the destruction wrought by Vikings. I thought that I thought it was sort of a cliche of early medieval history that none of our surprising sources knew how to knew how to count. <laughs> it's and true. And when they speak about the enemy's raiding in their thousands and thousands, they mean lots and lots, possibly several hundred. Yeah, Sawyer's point was that when he had small numbers of. Uh, Ships in the fleet, you had exact numbers. And then when you had large fleets, all of a sudden you have numbers like 300, nice and round. That's his point. And also, but didn't somebody characterize Sawyer's Vikings as groups of long-haired tourists who occasionally roughed up the locals? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, that was the great historian, J.M. Wallace Adrill, who, to say the least, was skeptical. The recent trend in historiography is to downplay the destructiveness of the Vikings, noting that the raids were small in size and the destruction was only local, and as you pointed out, these activities were not restricted to Vikings. Viking apologists prefer to emphasize their role as merchants and settlers. You sort of get the sense that a lot of that some current day um, Danish people are more than faintly embarrassed by their Viking oh, ancestors. That's what we found when we went to Denmark, wasn't yeah, it? it was... Nobody wanted to talk about Vikings. Anyway. Okay. The Vikings were interested in trade and did establish important permanent trading centers. By the early 9th century, Scandinavian trading ports such as Hedeby, Birka, and Truso were flourishing along the coast of the Baltic Sea. The Rus Vikings established a long network of trade routes along the Russian river systems, trading with Constantinople and with the Muslims, selling them furs and slaves for silver coins. And they also um, raided along the way when they could. You sort of got the sense that these Scandinavian traders would size you up. If they thought you could defend yourself, they traded. If they thought you were vulnerable, they raided. I, I agree entirely. What's also been emphasized is that these Scandinavian Viking communities had a complex hierarchical social system, and they had well-developed legal institutions. They were also excellent workers in metal, skillful in the use of stone and timber for building, and boasted a distinctive and elaborate artistic style that emphasized animal motif motifs with gripping beasts, stylized animals, intricate interlacing designs. Oh, Ringerica, all that good yeah, stuff. Exactly. Yes, yes. They also settled Iceland, explored Greenland, and the coast of North America, and left an Im impact on the political and social development of Ireland and Britain. Well, left an impact is one hell of a euphemism. Yeah. Not all of it was positive. Except for the city of Dublin. The Irish city of Dublin was a Viking settlement. First settled in the 840s, Viking Dublin had become a center of commerce and industry, as well as a stronghold by the mid-10th century. Of course, the most important commodity exported from Dublin was... You guessed it, slaves. <laughs> as noted by contemporary Irish annals. So, the, were these merchants and settlers, were they really Vikings? You started by saying the best translation of Viking is pirate. I, Although, yeah, I think they're really the same people. Yeah, I think you made the point. One can't really draw too distinct a line between Vikings as traders and Vikings as pirates. If a town was strongly held, or if the Viking party was laden with booty well, needed to get rid of, the Vikings would sell their goods. If a town was easy prey, they'd sack it. All that having been said, the Vikings were brutal, marauding pirates who created devastation wherever it suited their purposes. As one monk writing in the 860s lamented, quote, The number of ships increases, the endless flood of Vikings never ceases to grow bigger. Everywhere Christ's people are the victims of massacre, burning, and plunder. Viking chieftains like Bjorn Ironside and Ivar the Boneless terrorized the lands of the San Loire and Trent Basins. If their devastation was not greater than it was, it was less because of restraint on their part than the lack of a sophisticated technology of destruction. From 841 to 892, hardly a year went by in which a Frankish chronicler did not record a Viking attack. As the British historian Rosamund McKittrick put it, quote, The Vikings were masters at attacking the defenseless, monks, people going to markets, merchants, end quote. Now, the main visual for Vikings, other than those cheesy horned helmets, is probably the Viking longship. Want to say a few words about that? Yeah. Most explanations of why Vikings suddenly appeared in the late 8th and early 9th century emphasize the development of a special type of 
naval vessel that was capable of sailing up rivers and crossing oceans. The Vikings were known for their seafaring, and in order to understand the military expeditions as well as their explorations, one must know something about their ships. Scandinavian boats of the 6th and 7th centuries lacked a true keel, and thus could not support a mast. These were rowing vessels, ships that were not suitable for long voyages. By the late 8th century and the 9th century, Scandinavian ship design had evolved considerably. The 9th century Gokstad ship, buried in Norway as part of a ship burial ritual, provides us with the dimensions of one Norse longship. The Gokstad ship was 23.3 meters in length and 5.25 meters amidship. The height from keel to gunwale is 1.95 meters. Her dead weight, unloaded, is about 9 tons. Fully loaded with crew and equipment, probably closer to 18 tons. The draft of the fully loaded ship would probably have been only about one meter. The hull is built of overlapping strakes that were first nailed together and then lashed to the frames by means of pliable spruce roots through holes in cleats left for freestanding when the planks were smoothed. Stop. The boat was almost sewed together. Yeah, exactly. The keel is T-shaped and the lowest two strakes of the ship were attached to the keel by nails. The planking keel and mast were all made of pine. The mast was about 10 meters high. The ship was steered by a large oar attached to the starboard side. The great characteristic of this vessel is her elasticity and lightness of weight. Because the frames were attached to the strakes by spruce roots, the vessel was less rigid than a nail ship. Fewer ribs were needed, and she was therefore lighter. The British Living History website, Regiang Lorem, has a nice webpage devoted to the construction of Viking ships, and I recommend it. The replica of the Gokstad ship that sailed from Norway to America in 1893 was recorded to have undulated with the waves. The bottom and keel rose and fell by as much as an inch, and the gunnels twist as much as six inches out of true. The Gokstad ship, however, was not a war vessel but a chieftain ceremonial ship. A warship a warship would have had a higher length to beam ratio and in fact would have been almost canoe-like. Riverine vessels such as the Ladby ship or the Skuldalef wreck number no. five were about 18 to 20 meters long and about three meters wide. It could accommodate a crew of maybe 30 warriors. Such ships were not ocean-going vessels, but would have been used in coastal waters and for raiding up estuaries. In the late 9th through 11th centuries, seagoing Viking warships ranged in size, though the most common seems to have been a 20 bencher with 40 oars. This would be more impressive if you and I had almost drowned while trying to help row a replica Viking warship in the Roskilde Fjord. Well, almost drowned is maybe a bit overly dramatic, but it really was kind of hairy. We're running out of time. Do you want to conclude by telling our listeners a little bit about who those Vikings were who raided Francia in England? Sure. Sure. The best way of doing this is through a case study. The Viking chieftain I've chosen doesn't have a saga written about him. We only know of him through contemporary English and Frankish chronicles. His name was Wieland. Wieland was the leader of a Viking fleet that ravaged Frisia in the late 850s. In the year 860, this Viking fleet landed in Hampshire and sacked the town of Winchester. The raiders ravaged further north, pushing perhaps as far as the Berkshire Downs. As they slowly made their way back to their ships laden with booty, a Wexaxon fern led by the eldermen of Berkshire and Hampshire intercepted them. The Welsh monk Asser, in his life of King Alfred, relates what happened next. Quote, the battle having been joined in earnest, the heathens were cut to pieces everywhere. When they could no longer resist, they took to flight like women, and the Christians had mastery over the field of death. End quote. But I take it that's not the end of the story of Wieland? It isn't even really the start of the story. Contemporary Frankish chronicles, in particular the Annals of San Bertan, permit us to track in unique detail the movements of these Vikings before and after they undertook their ill-fated expedition to Wessex, and to glimpse the complex 
political reality underlying contemporary sermons. The tale that emerges from the pens of the chroniclers, Bishop Prudentius and Archbishop Hinkmar, is far more complicated than a simple story of heathen predators and Christian prey. It tells rather of Frankish princes, predators themselves, who were not above hiring Vikings to fight other Vikings or even Christian rivals. According to the Annals of San Bertan, these same Vikings had established themselves the previous year near the Sum River. There they had come to an agreement with the West Frankish king, Charles the Bull, to drive off or kill a different band of Vikings who had built fortified bases on islands in the Seine River, first at Chafus and subsequently at Wassel. From these bases they conducted raids deep into the countryside, pillaging towns and churches. Charles the Bull, to the consternation of clerical chroniclers, was far more interested in securing his throne against the threats of his brothers, nephews, and counts than in dealing with Viking depredations. Charles regarded Vikings as a nuisance. His rival royal kinsmen, on the other hand, were an existential threat. But the Viking camp on the island of Wassel was too near Paris and the heartland of his domain to be completely ignored. Charles agreed to pay the some Vikings 3,000 pounds of silver to rid his domain of the same Vikings. While Charles raised the cash by taxing the treasures of churches and the houses of movable wealth of landowners and merchants, the some Vikings took hostages from the Franks and struck across the channel. Their rough reception at the hands of the West Saxons persuaded them to return to Francia, not quite soon enough for Charles's liking, as the same Vikings had sacked Paris in their absence. When Charles the Bull paid Wieland the full three thousand pounds of silver, weighed out under watchful Viking eyes, these Viking mercenaries were no more trusting of Charles than he of them, the Somme Vikings fulfilled their side of the bargain by besieging the Wassel stronghold of the Seine Vikings. As news of the siege spread, other Vikings decided to get in on the action. Wieland's forces swelled with the addition of a newly arrived fleet of 60 ships. Meanwhile, Charles gathered livestock, corn, and wine for his Viking allies so that the realm would not be looted. Finally, the besieged saying Vikings, quote, forced by starvation, filth, and general misery, end quote, surrendered. They agreed to pay Wieland 6,000 pounds of gold and silver and then joined up with him. With winter coming on, Wieland's forces chose not to brave the hazards of the North Sea and decided to winter over in Francia. Splitting up into smaller bands, they scattered on the ports and abbeys of the Seine Basin. Eventually, they left Charles's kingdom, but only after Wieland's son led the former Wassel Vikings from their base in the deserted monastery of Foss in an attack upon the town of Mur. For Bishop Hildegard of Mur, Charles's forbearance in allowing the Vikings to ravage the Seine Basin was a disgrace, and his permission for them to winter upstream from Paris was nothing short of treachery. Incompetence, yes. Treason? The bishop had reason to suspect that. The raid upon Mu may in fact have been done with Charles's tacit approval. Hildegard was a supporter of Charles's rebellious son, Louis the Stammerer. As one historian commented, quote, if Charles did not actually let the Foss Vikings loose on Mu, their activities there would not wholly have displeased him. In the ashes of Mu's buildings, late in 862, Louis the Stammerer and Hildegard would have seen daily reminders of the wages of sin, end quote. Whether or not Charles winked at the Danish attack on Mu, it gave him an opportunity to enhance his prestige through decisive action. It had already provoked a near rebellion among the peasantry of the saint Loire region, who in 859 had attempted to take matters into their own hands by forming a sworn association to resist the Danes by force of arms. Though the local magnates had quickly and forcefully put an end to such presumption... Wait a minute. Yeah. It, they, they didn't want peasants 
taking up arms against Vikings because they then would make, take up arms against them. You mean so, they'd rather see their peasants slaughtered and starved than to defend? Never mind. Never mind. I'm being naive. Okay. Go ahead. Keep By 862, they must have come to share their dependent frustrations. Charles responded by raising an army and stationing troops along both banks of the rivers Os, Mon, and Seine, threatening to cut off Vikings' escape to the open sea. By spring of 862, Wayland, who had sworn fealty to Charles, and the leaders of the other, other Viking bands agreed to return their captives and to depart the kingdom. The great fleet broke up into smaller bands, many of which sailed to Brittany to take service with the Breton chieftain Salomon. Others signed on with Salomon's rival, Robert the Strong of Anjou. Okay, so what happened to Wieland? Ah, uh, poor Wieland. Wieland himself returned to Charles's court within a year, apparently having lost command of his fleet. He, his wife, and their entourage accepted baptism, presumably in order to secure the Frankish king's favor. But in a really odd turn of events, the Viking chieftain was accused by one of his own men of, quote, bad faith, end quote, and of having sought baptism, quote, as a trick, end quote. He proved his accusation by killing Wieland in single combat in the presence of Charles and his court. This sounds fishy to me. And it also sounds fishy to me. It was a truism of the time that one had to be a fool to trust the oath of a pagan Viking. But Carolingian rulers could be just as treacherous, if a bit more subtle and clever about it. The story of the Viking Whalen sheds a great deal of light upon the Viking menace that English, Frankish, and Irish Christian rulers faced in the ninth century. These Vikings were not a people, and their war bands were not well-regulated armies. Though the chronicle sources often label Viking fleets as Danish or Norse, these terms better describe the leaders than the crews, who probably were a heterogeneous and variable lot. The Viking army of the Somme quite clearly was a composite force made up of various war bands, like flocks of migrating geese that joined together under one leader only to break up and reform under another. The Viking armies or heres, as they were termed in the old in the old English sources, represented fluid and shifting combinations of small fleets. The story of Wayland also shows the limitation of our sources. We know nothing about who or what he was before he went a Viking. The authors of the Annals of San Breton believed him to be a Dane, and presumably he was a man of some substance to have been chosen to lead the fleet by the other captains. But even this is speculation. We've run out of time, but we've barely scratched the subject of Vikings. We'll return to them in future episodes. I'd like to talk about Vikings in movies and television shows, and I'd like to have an episode dedicated to King Alfred the Great, who defeated the Vikings. And about whom you wrote a biography that you're supposed to be revising for a new edition. Yeah, I know, but stop nagging. No, no thank you for reminding me. You're right. You're absolutely right. Good recovery. Let's, uh, let's thank our listeners for joining us. If you're enjoying this podcast, please spread the word. Good ratings and reviews on podcast platforms really do help do that. So bye for now. I think I will sing us out with a little tune I wrote for one of my classes. Dear God, no. There is nothing like a Dane, nothing in the world. They're all hairy and insane. There ain't anything like a Dane. Stop. Please stop. Sorry, just one more verse. There are Visigoths galore who love to score at war. The Saracens at sea have ravaged Italy. Attila is a Hun who is anything but fun. They all should be slain, but they ain't no Dane. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.